Welcome to a new edition of System Update. I'm Glenn Greenwald. This episode explores exactly how it is that the United States Congress just last week ensured that the United States continues on its path of endless war. Who exactly in the U.S. Congress did it? What tactics and methods did they use? And what were the motives for their doing so? Specifically, last week, the House Armed Services Committee, which is the committee of the United States House of Representatives responsible for authorizing military spending, passed what it calls the National Defense Authorization Act, which is the military budget for the coming fiscal year of 2021. And as part of that military budget, the committee which is dominated by Democrats, which form a majority of the House of Representatives, voted to authorize $740 billion in military spending for the next year, even though it's been almost 20 years since the 9-11 attack, even though the United States is in the middle of a health pandemic, an unemployment crisis, and teetering on a depression that's causing millions upon millions of people to be highly uncertain about their economic future. And even though polling data uniformly shows that Americans overwhelmingly in both parties want there to be a reduced military commitment and a reduced military footprint, not an expanded one, the committee, by a vote of 56 to 0, 30 Democrats and 26 Republicans voted in favor of this extreme budget, a budget of $740 billion, which just to put that into context, is three times higher than the second highest military spender on the planet, which is China. It is 10 times higher than the third highest spender, which is Saudi Arabia, it is 15 times more than the country that was most frequently invoked as a grave threat to the United States to justify this budget, which is Russia. And the U.S. military budget for the coming year just approved by the House Armed Services Committee by a unanimous vote is also more than the military spending of the next 15 countries combined. And one of the things one realizes when watching the proceedings, the hour upon hour upon hour of congressional proceedings that result in these outcomes is this huge cleavage between how members of Congress present themselves, the imagery and rhetoric and branding they present to their voters on the one hand, and the reality of what they do in the bowels of Congress and the underbelly of congressional proceedings on the other, where most Americans, most constituents and voters have no idea what it is that they're doing, and this gap is enormous. The proceedings lasted more than 15 hours just on this single bill within this one committee, and watching it, as I did from start to finish, reveals really valuable insight that I wanted to devote this show to exploring and revealing and describing because it really shows how and why the United States continues to be a militaristic and imperialistic power that devotes enormous amounts of its resources, not on the well-being of its citizens, but for the benefit of military contractors and for imperialistic aims throughout the world. And understanding how it is that the United States Congress controlled by both parties, the Senate controlled by the Republicans, the House controlled by the Democrats, overwhelmingly joins together in order to do this is extremely valuable for understanding how the United States government actually functions and how different, wildly different that is from the imagery and the rhetoric and the propaganda that they themselves present that 24-hour cable news channels try and manufacture and how in general the United States media talks about U.S. politics. This is where the real action is. And it's really valuable to examine it in detail by looking at the videos of it and by understanding exactly what it is that they did. Now, even though the final budget was approved by a unanimous 56 to 0 vote, there were during that process a series of amendments that were debated, and that was really where the real action is. And these amendments are incredibly consequential for shaping and defining U.S. foreign policy and U.S. military policy. And there, there wasn't unanimity, but there was overwhelming bipartisan consensus, and we ought to focus 
on the debates and the ultimate votes surrounding those amendments because those shed the real light, the real insight into how exactly it is that Congress ensures that the United States remains a, a nation of endless war. There were over a dozen amendments, and let's focus on four of the most significant ones and the most revealing ones. There were four where there were a where there was a clear line between a pro-war imperialist position on the one hand and an anti-war or anti-imperialist position on the other. Those four amendments were the following. One was an amendment to block the Trump administration's announced plans to withdraw troops from Afghanistan, the longest war in U.S. history, by the end of the year. It imposed a series of conditions on the Trump administration that it has to meet, onerous conditions, that effectively would impede the Trump administration from meaningfully withdraw troops from Afghanistan and almost ensure that the goal announced by the White House of removing all troops from Afghanistan by the end of the year could not be met. So that was the First Amendment, to block the Trump White House plan to remove troops from Afghanistan. The Second Amendment was one that would block the Trump White House's announced plans to withdraw almost 10,000 troops out of the 30,000 or 35,000 that are in Germany. The United States has a contingent of 35,000 troops just stationed in Germany, which is a relic of the Cold War from NATO wanting to create a bulwark against the Soviet Union, which no longer exists. The Trump White House, like the Obama White House and even the Bush-Cheney White House before it, has a plan to pull back the number of troops, to reduce the number of troops, not to eliminate it entirely, but to reduce it from 35,000 to roughly 25,000. And the Second Amendment was one that was designed to block the Trump administration from doing that for 180 days, effectively to impede the ability of the Trump White House, even just to reduce the troop presence in Germany, let alone eliminate it. The Third Amendment was one that would limit the Trump administration's ability to continue to work with its Saudi allies to bomb Yemen by requiring a series of reports to Congress and placing limits on the funding that Congress authorizes for that bombing campaign. The Fourth Amendment was one which would require a whole series of reports and explanations and rationale as to why the Trump administration wants to withdraw from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty that was signed in the 1980s under Ronald Reagan with the Soviet Union that Trump has announced he wants to withdraw from. So in two of these cases, Yemen and the INF Treaty, it was an attempt to impede Trump from being more militaristic. And in the other two cases, Afghanistan and Germany, there was an attempt to impede Trump from taking a more anti-war or anti-imperialist position by withdrawing troops from Afghanistan and Germany. And in all four cases, all four of those amendments, the pro-war, pro-imperialist position prevailed, the anti-war, anti-imperialist position was defeated. And not only were they, was it defeated, but it was done by an overwhelming majority, a bipartisan consensus, typically with blue state Democrats working hand in hand with the member of Congress from the Republican Party who has become the leader of Republican pro-war hawkishness, Liz Cheney, who, despite having a father who was part and parcel of one of the most disgraced U.S. presidencies in history, whose father was responsible for the worst and most morally atrocious foreign policy disaster of at least the last generation, which was the invasion of Iraq and the creation of torture regimes, continues to exert incredible sway on U.S. foreign policy, even though she's a member of the minority party in the House of Representatives using the same ideology, the discredited, disgraced ideology from the war on terror, propagated for years by her father because she finds so many allies within the Democratic Party leadership from blue state Democrats who join with the pro-war faction of the Republican Party led on this committee by Liz Cheney to ensure endless war, pro-war imperialist policies continue to prevail. And understanding how exactly this works is crucial. And one point before we get into the specifics that I think it's really worth underscoring is that what this shows, among many things, is that bipartisan consensus 
is how Washington works. And this is such an important point to understand because so often we're told, in fact, you could even argue that it's one of the main observations that mainstream journalists make, that cable news pundits make, that even members of both political parties make about the U.S. political culture in Washington is that the two parties are always at loggerheads. They have such radically different views of the world that they can't agree on anything. They never work together. There's no more bipartisanship the way this is a complete and utter lie. The vast majority of issues, of laws, of bills, of policies are fueled by bipartisan consensus, agreement between the establishment wing of the Democratic Party and the establishment wing of the Republican Party. And one of the things that happens propagandistically is that whenever the two parties' establishment wings agree on a policy, such as the four amendments that I just recounted, where they joined together to ensure that the pro-war policy prevailed, or the $740 billion military budget, or U.S. support for Israel or for Arab state dictators, or a whole slew of other policies where both parties agree, the media essentially ignores those issues because they're not interested in them. They're only interested when they can show on cable news or in the op-ed pages some kind of hard, hardened clash between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And this has two really important effects. Number one is it removes from public consciousness, from public awareness, the extremely consequential policy areas where the Republicans and Democrats of the establishment wings of each party actually agree so it doesn't get debated whether we should spend $740 billion or whether we should stay in Afghanistan or whether we should keep troops in Germany, even though American citizens are suffering in mass because the two parties agree and therefore the media doesn't talk about it because it's just assumed that it's not very interesting. There must be, because of this consensus, a clear and irrefutable truth to whatever that policy is. So it just gets removed from public consciousness and public debate. That's one effect. The other effect is that by only focusing on those instances in which the Republicans and Democrats disagree, the extent to which they clash is wildly exaggerated. Whatever the percentage is, if it's 70% of the policies where Democrats and Republicans agree in this nice bipartisan consensus and 30% where they're fighting, if you only focus on the 30%, because that's the only thing that's interesting, and you ignore the 70% where they're agreeing and voting by overwhelming votes, if not unanimous votes, in favor of the same policy, it creates this radically distorted view that they're always fighting. But it only looks like they're only fighting, they're always fighting, because the media only focuses on those issues where they fight, ignoring the much greater number of policy areas where they agree. And looking at how, the, how this House Armed Services Committee enacted this extremely militaristic, imperialistic, and pro-war bloated budget to benefit the Pentagon, and especially the private arms dealers and defense industry and lobbyists who work for them and the military itself really illustrates what a propagandistic myth this is that the Republicans and the Democrats simply can't agree. They're always at loggerheads. The reality is they work together constantly as demonstrated by how much in common Liz Cheney has with the key Democratic Party leaders in the House who are responsible for shaping foreign and military policy. Now, it should go without saying that one of the most important ways for understanding what the Congress does and the reasons why it does it is to explore the people who are driving the process, the members of Congress. It shouldn't be a surprise that the Republican Party is overtly pro-war and pro-imperialist, that people like Liz Cheney and her family and that wing of the Republican Party that was so dominant during the Bush and Cheney years and into the Obama years continues to exert great influence on the party's military and foreign policy posture in a way that is pro-war, notwithstanding the uh, ascension of an isolationist wing within the Republican Party, as evidenced by the campaign rhetoric of Donald Trump in 2016. And prior to that, the relative, re relative success of people like Ron Paul or Rand Paul in the Senate, Ron Paul when he ran for president, advocating an isolationist line that is different in ethos from the anti-war sentiment on the left but still converges in terms of policy views, this right-wing isolationist posture that says that we ought not to be spending money on foreign wars and on changing other countries. We ought to be spending that money instead on the welfare of American citizens. 
That wing of the Republican Party, notwithstanding its finding expression in the successful Trump campaign, is still a minority within the Republican Party. The majority in the Republican Party is still very much pro-war, pro-imperialist. People like John McCain, when he was alive, was probably the single most influential figure in the Republican Party on these questions, and he was harshly pro-war. He was very critical, for example, of President Obama for eight years for failing in his view to sufficiently confront Russia and Vladimir Putin. The same with people like Lindsey Graham and Marco Rubio, and then all kinds of members of the House. It's a reason why Liz Cheney, as recent reports suggest, has become a leading voice, foreign policy voice, within the Republican Party, because that strain of Republican Party politics that is extremely pro-war, pro-militarism, pro-imperialism, is still the dominant strain in Republican politics. How is it, though, that they form a majority when the Democrats are the majority party in the House. And to understand how that works, that dynamic, it's very important to look at the people who have been empowered by the Democratic Party to be the leaders on foreign policy. So the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, one of the most important positions in the House of Representatives and probably the single most important when it comes to foreign policy and military spending, is Congressman Adam Smith, who isn't very known to very many people, even within his own district. He's highly uncharismatic. He blends into the woodwork. He tends to be a transactional kind of lawmaker instead of one who's frequently on cable news or being particularly flamboyant or attention grabbing. But his influence is all the greater because of that. He's kind of a classic standard Democratic Party politician and has been for the last 23 years since he's been in Congress. He comes from a very blue state of Washington and a pretty blue district as well, where whites are just under even being a majority. So the majority of his district are people of color. And Adam Smith, in the realm in which he exerts the greatest influence, which is foreign and military policy, is clearly a pro-war hawk. There's no other way to describe him. One of the most important first votes that he had upon being elected to Congress was the question of whether to authorize the war in Iraq. He was one of the many Democrats in Congress in 2002 who voted in favor of the Iraq war and proceeded to advocate its wisdom and its necessity for many years to come. He advocated and supported and voted for a whole slew of Bush-Cheney war on terror policies in the years after the attacks of 9-11. In the wake of the Snowden reporting, he was one of the Democrats who joined with Republicans to block reforms that were proposed by a bipartisan group in Congress led by then Republican Justin Amash and then Democrat John Conyers. He joined with Republicans to defeat reforms that were proposed in terms of how the NSA could spy on American citizens. So he's over and over and over again supported militarism and war. And this is who the Democratic Party caucus and Nancy Pelosi have chosen to be the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, someone with this record. Even in the Obama years, he often was to the right or to the pro-war side of the Obama administration. He was warning of Obama's desired effort to withdraw troops and end the, from Afghanistan and end the war there. He was one of only 16 Democrats to join with the Republican majority to block a what would have been a law banning the U.S. from transferring weapons to Saudi Arabia to be used to bomb Yemen. This is who is the single most influential member of Congress in the Democratic Party when it comes to shaping military spending and foreign policy. Is it any wonder that pro-war and imperialism policies continue to prevail when the Democrats are empowering people like this? In 2018, because of that whole record that I just recounted, Congressman Smith had a primary challenger, someone clearly to his left, Sarah Smith, no relation, a working class progressive socialist who really attacked Adam Smith on the grounds that he was supporting hardcore militarism, hardcore imperialism that was diverting resources away from the United States, away from what could be improving the lives of American citizens and into the pockets of the lobbyist and the military in industrial complex that funds his campaign and that he serves. And in 2018, as this primary challenge began to become a little bit more credible, my colleague Lee Fong, writing for The Intercept, reported extensively on how the defense industry opened up their coffers and began to pour their money into Congressman Smith's war chest to ensure that one of their most loyal servants, one of their most important servants, 
that ensures that the United States stays on the path of endless war would be reelected to Congress. As Li Fong wrote, quote, Lobbyists and executives associated with General Dynamics, one of the largest weapon makers in the world, have given over $10,000 to Smith in recent weeks, in addition to the $9,500 from the company over the last quarter. In just the last week of October, Teresa Carlson, an Amazon industry executive overseeing the company's bid for a $10 billion military IT contract, gave $1,000. Bechtel, which managed Iraq reconstruction contracts, gave $1,000. Rolls-Royce, which manufactures parts for a variety of military jets, including a model of the controversial F-35, gave $3,500. And Phoebe Novakovich, the chief executive of General Dynamics, gave $2,700. Now, in the scheme of congressional spending, that may not seem like huge numbers, but what it does is it signals to Adam Smith who his friends are, who the people are who are going to fund his campaign when he most needs it, when he's facing a primary challenger in a district that if he gets the nomination, he's sure to win. Textron, which is the maker of cluster bombs that the United States gave to Saudi Arabia and used in Yemen, gave $24,000 to Adam Smith over the prior decade. So it really should be no surprise that the Democrats are led by somebody who is extremely pro-war and imperialistic and therefore enact and support pro-war and imperialistic policies. And it's not like this is done by lottery that he became the House Armed Services Committee Chairman. He was chosen by the Democratic caucus, by Nancy Pelosi, to ascend to that position precisely because they want to serve the defense industry. They want to serve these lobbyists so that the more money continues to pour into their coffers. These are the people who are running foreign policy and military policy for the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives. That explains why we get things like $740 billion military budget, along with one pro-war amendment after the next prevailing. Let's look at one more really important person on the House Armed Services Committee, the committee that enacted this bill last week. His name is Jason Crow. He's a congressman from Colorado. And what's really interesting about Jason Crow is that he became the leader along with Liz Cheney, the two of them joined together in a partnership, in a team, to craft legislation that only had one purpose, to prevent the Trump White House from withdrawing troops, not all troops, some troops, from Afghanistan with the goal of finally ending this 20-year war, the longest war in U.S. history. It was Jason Crow, the Democrat, joining with Liz Cheney, the Republican, to co-sponsor this legislation, to craft it together, and then jointly advocate for it. Who is Jason Crow? He is one of the dozens of members of the Democratic House Caucus who either served previously in the intelligence community as a CIA official, a Pentagon official, or a member of the military. The, the Democratic Party in the House, led by Pelosi and Steny Hoyer, became obsessed with recruiting people from the military, people from the intelligence community, to show a more militaristic face of the Democratic Party. And in fact, in 2018, Jason Crow, like Adam Smith, had a progressive challenger who, among other things, was critiquing him for being too pro-war, too pro-militaristic. And Steny Hoyer, the longtime Democratic congressman and the number two House Democrat right behind Nancy Pelosi, he's the uh, House Majority Leader who runs with an iron fist who it is that the Democrats will support in these districts, tried to bully and pressure the progressive challenger to, to Jason Crow into leaving the race. And my colleague Lee Fong, the great investigative journalist, obtained a copy of a covertly taped conversation between Steny Hoyer and that progressive challenger in which Hoyer made clear that he wanted him out of the race. Meanwhile, in the race for Congress, the DCCC, or the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, has moved aggressively to crush competitive primaries. DCCC officials and senior Democrats are hand-picking moderate, business-friendly candidates and are attempting to push progressives out of key races. In Colorado's 6th District, one of the most competitive seats in the country, the DCCC moved in early to select Jason Crow, a corporate lawyer, as the party candidate, pushing resources, endorsements, and money to Crow while elbowing out progressive Democratic competitors. The Democratic Party often denies that they play favorites. What follows is a meeting between Congressman Steny Hoyer, the number two Democrat in the House, and Levi Tilleman, a progressive running for the nomination for the Colorado seat. 
Levi, I want to, obviously I want to talk to you about this congressional race. Absolutely, that's what I expected. Yeah. You would like me to get out of the race. And you keep saying, I would like you to get out. And of course, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Now, there's nothing unique about Adam Smith or Jason Crow when it comes to the Democratic Party caucus in the House and specifically on the House Armed Services Committee. You take a look at who funds the members of the House Armed Services Committee, with a few exceptions, and you will find that it is the defense sector, the weapons manufacturers, the military contractors and lobbyists who fund the members of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party on the House Armed Services Committee to ensure servitude and loyalty to that cause. You just go down the list and see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars being donated by the very industries that the House Armed Services Committee is authorized in order to fund. Now, let's just pause here for a moment to realize what this says about American politics. Think about how Democrats and Republicans are perceived. The same members of the House Armed Services Committee who spend their time, their actual time in Washington, enacting pro-war militaristic policies, that Americans overwhelmingly oppose, keeping troops in Afghanistan, continuing that war, keeping troops deployed throughout the war, including the world, including in Germany, continuing to bomb Yemen, something that most Americans don't even know about, but that polls show in general Americans want a much more reduced footprint and commitment to endless war. As they work in the bowels of Congress, in subcommittee meetings, in committee meetings, to serve their donors in a way that Americans almost never see, they then go back to their districts and do their propaganda. They go back to their districts and they talk about gun control and the evils of the NRA, and they champion causes like LGBT equality and reproductive rights, and they talk about immigration and the Republicans' efforts to restrict immigration. So the perception gets created that these are good, liberal politicians. These are people who are nice liberals who serve a liberal political ideology, which is why they continue to get elected and reelected in very blue states and in very blue districts. And the reality is much different when they go back to Washington. They don't work on those issues that they talk about to their constituents. They instead spend their time ensuring that tens of billions of dollars and hundreds of billions of dollars continues to pour out of the coffers of the American taxpayers into the bank accounts of weapons and military uh, manufacturers, and that endless war continues at the expense of the very people who believe that they're serving a liberal political agenda. And even if they are serving a liberal political agenda— by voting occasionally in favor of gun control or in favor of LGBT rights or in favor of reproductive rights, issues that are decided much more by the Supreme Court than the Congress. But even if they were doing that, they're also at the same time enacting policies that are killing huge numbers of people around the world that are ensuring that the United States commits most of its resources to lobbyists and weapons manufacturers and being a military hegemonic imperialist power in a way that most people have no idea that they're doing and that polls continuously show most people oppose. Now, let's think about how it is that they get away with that. What is it that enables them to do that? I don't think it's particularly sophisticated to observe that in order for a country like the United States to remain on a posture of endless war, a path of continuous militarism, you need an enemy. For 50 years after the end of World War II, that enemy was the Soviet Union, global communism. And keeping Americans afraid of global communism and the Soviet Union and Moscow and the Kremlin were crucial to ensuring that military budgets continued to explode, that one war after the next, from Korea to Vietnam to Central America, and on and on and on, were justifiable in the name of stopping this grave threat to American security. And then once the Soviet Union fell at the end of the 1980s, throughout the 1990s, the American polity stumbled around looking for an enemy, but since there was really no hardcore enemy, they fought a war in Yugoslavia, they 
uh, declared themselves to be the hegemon, the only superpower that America would receive a peace dividend as a result of no longer needing to compete with this imperialistic power. The reality is military budgets never decrease because the same people and the same frameworks and dynamics continue to rule how Washington functions. And then, of course, with the September 11th attacks, a whole new enemy, al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, radical Islam, appeared and became the substitute for the Soviet Union. And it lasted at least a decade through the Bush-Cheney years and even into the Obama years where people continue to be afraid of al-Qaeda and radical Islam. But it's really been a long time since there have been major attacks. Obviously, there have been individual cases that have been horrific, done in the name of radical Islam or hatred of American foreign policy, things like the poll shooting. But there's been no coordinated, sustained attack like 9-11 or anything like it since then. And so Americans wake up and don't really fear al-Qaeda anymore, especially since bin Laden was killed, or uh, fear even ISIS, which became the substitute for al-Qaeda for a couple of years. And then they kind of faded into the imagination of American fears. And so a new villain was needed. And that villain became Russia. That villain is Russia. That is the villain that is used to justify these military budgets and this continuous pro-war posture. If you look at the House Armed Services Committee debate and proceedings as we're about to do in detail, what you will find is that over and over again, whenever it came time for people like Liz Cheney or Jason Crow or the other pro-war Democrats and pro-war Republicans to justify why it is necessary to spend almost a trillion dollars every year on military spending, why it's necessary to keep troops all over the world bombing Yemen, in Germany, fighting in Afghanistan, withdrawn from the INF Treaty. The argument, the issue, the villain that was invoked was Russia. Even though Russia spends one-fifteenth of what the United States spends on military spending, even though President Obama himself spent eight years arguing that Russia was a minor Eastern European power, a regional power at most that posed no threat to the United States, even though Obama continually refused to do provocative things like arm the Ukrainians with lethal weapons or confront Russia in Syria in order to topple Assad on the grounds that it wasn't worth provoking Russia because it wasn't a threat to the United States. Despite all of that, Russia has reemerged as the primary threat that justifies all of these incredibly consequential and costly policies. And there are still people on the left who struggle with understanding and who I see them all the time asking, why is it that we should even care about Russiagate, even if we think Russiagate was this kind of exaggerated, deranged conspiracy? Why does it matter to my politics? This is ignorance of the highest order. The reason it matters is because Russia... The threat of Russia that has materialized since 2016 is highly instrumentalized. It's weaponized. It plays an incredibly important role in these policies that people on the left and some people on the right are insistent that they oppose. It's the fuel that ensures that it continues. Not just in the United States. When Great Britain tried to increase its military spending, and the question was, were a country plagued by rampant unemployment, people are suffering economically to the point that they voted for Brexit despite knowing that it would cause harm because they were so angry. Why should we spend money, more money, to increase our military spending when we're not being threatened by any country? The answer that the British military gave, that generals gave, that wanted bloated military spending was Russia. They just said Russia over and over. It was Russia that financed Brexit was the claim. Russia that's a threat to the United Kingdom. Russia is an expansionist power that we need to increase our military budgets in order to constrain. That was the justification for increasing military spending in the United Kingdom as well. And let's remember how valuable of a domestic political tool Russia is also. Recall that when Bernie Sanders essentially won the first three primaries and caucuses are tied in Iowa, barely behind Pete Buttigieg, and then one in New Hampshire, and then one overwhelmingly in Nevada. One of the ways that they tried to stop the Sanders campaign was by leaking that Russia, which now plays this crucial role in the American imagination, was trying to help Bernie Sanders become president of the United States or at least secure the Democratic Party nomination. That was the story they leaked at the exact moment that the Sanders campaign reached what would be the peak of its momentum.
a pretty significant development. A formal briefing now by the U.S. intelligence community to Senator Sanders that the Russians are trying to help him. That's right, Wolf. It's happening again. And this is exactly what uh, certainly the intelligence community has been looking for. They were waiting for uh, sometime this year in the election season to brief the campaigns about what exactly they're seeing. And it appears, according to the Washington Post, that they've now approached the, the Bernie Sanders campaign to let him know that the Russian government is behind some efforts to try to assist this campaign. Now, we don't know exactly what those uh, efforts entail, but we certainly saw this in 2016. There were some efforts uh, by the Russian online trolls to not only help Donald Trump, but to help uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign to try to hurt Hillary Clinton's campaign. Again, this is something we saw uh, in the 2016 campaign. And then on the eve of the Nevada caucus, which Sanders ended up winning, he was asked on the tarmac, about that report, and he was very cynical, recognizing that it had been instrumentalized and weaponized against him. Here's what he said. Uh, I have got to say, sorry, you're not going to do this in this election. And again, as president of the United States, Mr. Putin, you will not interfere in our election. And if this came out a month ago, how, do you, how did you think it came out now, if you had the briefing a month ago? Well, I'll let you guess about one day before the, Iowa, the uh, Nevada caucus. Why do you think it came out? Was the Washington Post? Good friends. But the idea that Russia is a grave threat to United States interests is so ingrained in American politics, particularly in Democratic Party politics, that it clearly harmed the Sanders campaign to some extent. In the debate leading up to what became the devastating blow of his blowout loss to Joe Biden in South Carolina, over and over on the debate stage, the specter of Russia was raised both to point out these news reports from the intelligence community that the the Putin controlled Kremlin wanted Sanders to win but also linking Sanders to Russia to the old version of Russia the communist Russia by saying he was too friendly with Fidel Castro and with the Sandinistas and with the Soviet Union this idea that Russia is a major threat to the United States cannot be ignored if you're on the left or if you're on the anti-war or anti-imperialist pro isolationist part of the right because Russia is now the primary justifier for these pro-war, pro-imperialism policies that continues to keep the United States military budget radically bloated over and over. It's what these pro-war members of Congress cited when justifying their pro-war positions. Now, to see how all of this plays out, how all of it works in the U.S. Congress and the committee hearings that Americans readily watch or even read about, Let's examine the four amendments that I described earlier and what exactly happened within the House Armed Services Committee last week by looking at the video of what took place. Let's start with the amendment that was designed to prevent the Trump White House from proceeding with its announced plan to withdraw troops from Germany. Not all troops, as I said, but roughly 10,000 of the 35,000 troops that are stationed in Germany as a relic of the Cold War on the grounds that the original impetus or justification for putting the troops there, serving as a bulwark against uh, Soviet aggression into Western Europe, obviously no longer applies since the Soviet Union no longer exists, but those troops have remained. The lead member of Congress, of the committee, to sponsor an amendment to prevent the Trump administration from taking a single troop out of Germany for 180 days and then requiring them to meet a series of onerous conditions in order to do it after that was, on the one hand, Congresswoman Liz Cheney, the Republican, and on the other, Congressman Ruben Gallego, who is a Democratic representative from Arizona. He's one of the touted members of the Latino caucus, and he is an Iraq war veteran who has often taken a pro-military spending, pro-war posture when it comes to the House Armed Services Committee. Here was Congressman Gallego explaining why it's necessary in his view to keep all 35,000 troops, not even allow a partial reduction of the number of troops in Germany to save money, to bring that money back to the United States, to bring those troops home back to the United States. According to him, it's necessary, at least in part, because of the threat posed by Russia. Mr. Chairman, this amendment that I'm bringing with Mr. Bacon will protect our force posture in Germany and Europe. At this time, we can't afford to reduce our presence in Europe. Russia is a major threat to our country and to the free world. Our deterrence posture in Germany is a key reason that Russia no longer controls most of Eastern Europe. 
Our German bases have treated thousands of our service members who have been wounded in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. Our air bases in Germany enable the rapid deployment of our troops around the world on almost no notice. And our force posture throughout Europe is designed and well placed to deter any Russian attack on NATO. Now, the opposition to this amendment was led by a handful of anti-war and anti-imperialism members of Congress on the left, and then a handful of isolationist right-wing populists on the right. One of the members of the committee from the right that worked with those anti-war members of the left in this instance of trying to bring troops home from Germany, but others as well, was the pro-Trump member of Congress, Matt Gates from Northern Florida. And he worked extensively with Ro Khanna and others in order to impede some of these imperialistic policies. Here's what Matt Gates said in arguing why it was nece not necessary to keep these troops in Germany and why the arguments in their favor involving Russia made no sense. I do not believe that our current presence in Germany is the reason why Russia no longer controls Eastern Europe. That was the argument the gentleman made, and I, I can't believe he was able to make it with a straight face. It's not as if our presence in Germany stopped Russia from marching into Crimea. They were able to do that despite our 35,000 troops in Germany. It's deeply disappointing that when you have Republicans and Democrats around the country seeking to put our, our nation first, seeking less U.S. involvement, that there seems to be tremendous bipartisan uh, belief on the committee that we ought to be engaged everywhere at a tremendous high, tr tremendously high cost and with, I think, little impact on global affairs beyond uh, the draining of our military, the overextension of our resources, and the limitation of our capabilities. Now, earlier in the week on Twitter, Matt Gates and Ro Khanna jointly vowed to work together on anti-war amendments, including the uh, attempt to defeat the amendment that would have kept troops in Afghanistan. They vowed to work together, even though they're on the right and the left, on the grounds that they have this common ground of wanting to reduce American imperialism. Here's what Ro Khanna said after Congressman Gates spoke in agreeing with Congressman Gates in supporting his efforts to defeat this amendment from Liz Cheney and from Ruben Gallego about why the money would be better spent not on deploying troops in Western Europe as a relic of the Cold War, but in bringing them home to U.S. soil. Here's Congressman Khanna. I uh, am supportive of Representative Gates's objection to this amendment. Uh, the reality is progressives have always been for the rational reduction of troops abroad uh, to prevent uh, further engagement in the Middle East and to bring that money home so we can spend it on jobs in our country, infrastructure in our country. Uh, President Obama in 2012, as you know, Mr. Chairman, recommended a 7,000 uh, reduction of troops from Europe. Uh, that was President Obama's policy. Now, of course, everyone uh, on this committee is opposed to uh, Russian aggression. But the reality is that 34,000 troops didn't stop them from marching into Crimea. Uh, the way to stop Russian aggression is not going to be determined with whether we have uh, 5,000, 9,000 more troops sitting there in Germany. If 34,000 couldn't stop them, uh, I doubt 25,000 is going to uh, be a deterrent uh, in stopping them. But this debate didn't last very long. There was overwhelming consensus in the committee to prevent the Trump White House from removing troops from Germany. It, the amendment from uh, Congressman Gallagher and Liz Cheney passed easily. Only a handful of members on the right and the left voted against it, and therefore it passed. And so the Trump administration is now barred from withdrawing troops from Germany by the U.S. Congress doing what they constitutionally have the right to do, which is refusing to authorize spending that is necessary to bring those troops home. They simply blocked spending and said, we won't fund any effort to bring troops home from Germany until after 180 days and until these conditions are met. The Republican and the Democratic establishment of the party ensured the ongoing military presence in Germany at the full rate and force that it's been for decades. Now let's look at the same thing that happened, but in a more consequential way, which was the attempt to block any uh, plans on the part of the Trump White House and the Pentagon to finally end the war in Afghanistan after almost 20 years, a war now being fought 
overwhelmingly by people who barely were even born at the time of the 9-11 attack or were extremely young. It's the next generation fighting this war that started almost 20 years ago. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the lead sponsor with Liz Cheney in ensuring that President Trump and the Trump White House are barred from withdrawing troops is Jason Crow of Colorado. And listen to what he says about why he proposed an amendment to impede the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan as a Democrat. And I want to make sure that with respect to Afghanistan, as we do this, that we are doing it in the right way. See, in Afghanistan, we are not there alone. Afghanistan is the first time that our NATO partners after 9-11 stood by us and invoked mutual self-defense and came to our aid and can, they continue to fight and die with us today. There are tens of thousands of Afghan forces, men and women, who do the same, who have relied on our commitment and are not quite ready to stand on their own. Now, just to give you a sense of how little has changed since the height of the mania of the Bush Cheney years when it came to the war on terror, listen to Republican Congressman Michael Waltz of Florida's 6th Congressional District explain why he agrees with Congressman Crow, why he was going to support the amendment proposed by the Democratic majority, supported by Liz Cheney. Just listen to what he says about why he also believes that troops can't be withdrawn from Afghanistan to see what it is that Democrats are joining with, the mentality that they are in a coalition with. Listen to how, what a throwback this is to Dick Cheney and Paul Wolfowitz and Don Rumsfeld, most maximalist militaristic views about the war on terror generally and the war in Afghanistan specifically. The bottom line is we have to, as a nation, stay on offense against terrorism. Intelligence officials, military officials have been clear that Al-Qaeda, the Haqqani Network, the Taliban, and ISIS intend to strike the United States again, and will do so if we completely remove our foot off of their neck. We must fight these wars in places abroad, not here at home. Now, as I wrote last week, the story that appeared in the New York Times that was leaked by anonymous CIA officials as usual that claimed that the Kremlin was paying quote-unquote bounties to Taliban fighters to kill American troops in Afghanistan, that leak took place days after the Trump administration announced its definitive plan to withdraw more troops from Afghanistan and bring it to the smallest level that it would have been since... Uh, October of 2001. And that bounty story, that bounty leak, whether intended or not, and you can be naive and say that you don't think it was intended and it was just the outcome, or you can be a realist and recognize that this is what the military industrial complex always does whenever anyone tries to end their posture of endless wars, which is they leak selectively and creatively to make the climate impossible to do it. This was often cited during the debate by the people on the Democratic Party side who wanted the war in Afghanistan to continue. Here, for example, is one of the most right-wing hawkish members of the Democratic Party caucus, Seth Moulton, who, again, is also an Iraq war veteran, a pro-war advocate, very reliably and consistency, consistently. And here's what he said, citing that Russia bounty story, to say that we cannot leave Afghanistan yet because Russia poses such a grave threat to the United States. This is how Russiagate is used continuously in Congress and why you can't ignore it if you purport to be an opponent of militarism and pro-war posture and imperialism. There's been bipartisan criticism of what a weak deal he got with the Taliban, a deal that's already falling apart. But now we learn that he was making this deal at the same time as there were bounties on the heads of American troops, American sons and daughters. We clearly need more oversight over what the president is doing in Afghanistan. I'd like to see the longest war in American history come to a close as well. But I don't want to see it, to see it come to a close at the expense of our national security or at the expense of our troops.
Now, as I indicated earlier, Ro Khanna, the genuinely progressive member uh, of Congress from California, not always progressive, but consistently progressive. He was the co-chairman of the Bernie Sanders campaign, publicly declared on Twitter that he wanted to work with Congressman Gates to prevent these efforts to continue the war in Afghanistan. And Congressman Gates was one of the most outspoken and vocal members of this committee, of the House Armed Services Committee, in opposing the amendment from Jason Crow and Liz Cheney to continue the war in Afghanistan. And listen to what Matt Gates said. He said that there is a left-right coalition of populists in Congress who oppose the war. And even though they're a small minority on the House Armed Services Committee, they, po they compose a much larger block in the Congress itself. And that this alliance, of co this coalition between left-wing populists on the one hand who are outside of the establishment wing of the Democratic Party and right-wing populists on the other who are outside of the establishment wing of the Republican Party, at least as it exists in Congress, are the only chance this coalition to stop endless war in Afghanistan and beyond, to prevent money from going into the coffers of the military industrial complex and weapons manufacturers, and instead to bring it home to improve the lives of American citizens. This is what Matt Gates, the right-wing pro-Trump congressman from Northern Florida said in opposing the joint Liz Cheney Democratic leadership amendment to block withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the next amendment, I presume my friend Mr. Khan of California will seek to reassert Congress's war powers as it relates to Yemen. And many of my Republican colleagues will debate against that war powers uh, amendment, and they'll argue that it unfairly uh, restricts the administration's, uh, or it unfairly ties their hands. But here, many Republicans are going to support Mr. Crow's amendment that, in fact, ties the administration's hands when it comes to leaving Afghanistan. You know, the, the gentleman said there's always a right way and a wrong way to leave. I would say that a great nation does not force the next generation to fight their wars. And that's what we've done in Afghanistan. I think the best day to have not had the war in Afghanistan was when we started it, and the next best day is tomorrow. I don't think there's ever a bad day to end the war in Afghanistan. But very few people on the committee paid much attention to any of those anti-war arguments because they knew they had an overwhelming bipartisan majority in order to ensure that they could block any prospect or of the end of the war in Afghanistan. And so one of the last people to speak before the vote was a very confident and smug and arrogant Liz Cheney who invoked her father's rhetoric about how the war in terror functions, about the reason why the U.S. needs to stay in Afghanistan as she very calmly excoriated Congressman Gates for opposing the ongoing war in Afghanistan and made very clear that this policy that's now 20 years old needed to continue. And she knew very shortly when the vote happened by a bipartisan majority would continue. Listen to one of the leaders of the House of Representatives controlled by the Democratic Party shaping U.S. foreign policy and military policy, Congresswoman Liz Cheney. I, I want to begin by um, thanking my colleague, Mr. Crow, for his uh, very diligent uh, work on this. This this is a very uh, careful amendment, very careful piece of legislation um, that focuses on what's really critical uh, about um, what we need to do to protect our security and what needs to be done in Afghanistan. We need to make sure that we're denying terrorist safe havens. We need to make sure that we are uh, able to continue counterterrorism activity. Uh, you know, I, I listened to my colleague, Mr. Gates, say that. Uh, quote, we started it. Uh, and I, I would just urge um, everyone in this room, and I know all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, recognize uh, how uh, flawed that assessment is. We didn't start this. We were attacked on 9-11. And the reality of the situation is Al-Qaeda, ISIS, a number of those same terrorist groups uh, continue to operate in Afghanistan. In fact, uh, we have reports that Ayman al-Zawahiri uh, uh, has been in Afghanistan recently, may be there now. Shortly after Liz Cheney voted, the roll call vote was held. And one member of the committee after the next, first from the Democratic side and then from the Republican side, marched forward figuratively, spoke and voted in favor of the Crow-Cheney Amendment to block any attempted withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. Only 11 members of the committee ended up voting no 
eight Republicans and three Democrats. Those three Democrats were Congressman Ro Khanna, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, who is retiring, and Congressman Anthony Brown, who represents Maryland's fourth congressional district, but overwhelmingly members of, of the committee, Democrats and Republicans, voted in favor of the Crow Cheney bill. Here's how they did it. Uh, this is the amendment regarding uh, troops in Afghanistan. Question results, uh, sorry, the question occurs on the amendment and the clerk will call the roll. Chairman Smith. Aye. Chairman Smith votes aye. Mr. Thornberry. Aye. Mr. Thornberry votes aye. Ms. Gabbard. Ms. Gabbard votes no. Mr. Moulton. Mr. Moulton votes aye. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook votes aye. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown votes no. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves votes aye. Mr. Khanna. No. Mr. Khanna votes no. Mr. Cisneros. Mr. Cisneros votes aye. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates votes no. Mr. Crow. Aye. Mr. Crow votes aye. Mr. Banks. Mr. Banks votes no. Ms. Torres Small. Ms. Torres Small votes aye. Ms. Cheney. Ms. Cheney votes aye. Mr. Chairman, on this vote, the ayes are 45, the noes are 11. The amendment is agreed to. And so with that, the Senate is almost certain to join the House in enacting legislation unless there can be a left-right coalition assembled of the kind that Congressman Gates described to block this. It's almost certain that the Senate will join the House, the Democratic-led House, the Republican-led Senate, in blocking any attempt on the part of the Trump White House to do what it has announced it wants to do, which is in stages, remove troops from Afghanistan until none are left by the end of the year and finally fulfill what the Trump White House announced was its agreement with the Taliban to end the war in Afghanistan. The Democrats and Republicans are working together in the House successfully in the Armed Services Committee to prevent that from happening and to ensure that this war gets even longer and even older. A very similar dynamic happened with the amendment regarding the INF Treaty, which was a case not where the House Democrats wanted to impede Trump from pursuing a policy to wind down wars or wind down a true presence, but where they wanted to impede him from pursuing a more militaristic course of confrontation with Russia by withdrawing from this longstanding arms control treaty. And one of the key sponsors of this amendment that would have placed impediments in the way of the Trump White House from withdrawing from this treaty was Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, who, despite being an Iraq war veteran, a member of the military, has often advocated, not always, but often advocated policies against regime change wars and other postures of militarism and aggression, knowing what they actually entail. And all she wanted to do was to demand that the Trump White House present a report, an explanation, rationale, for why it thought that it was necessary or in the interest of the United States to withdraw from this arms control treaty and be more confrontational with Russia and to prevent them from doing so until that report was obtained. That's all this amendment that she proposed sought to do. And here's what she said about it. Recently, rather than commit to negotiations that would address the issues with the treaty and further improve it, President Trump made the decision to walk away from it. This committee has asked for a report from the administration to tell us why he made this decision, what need was addressed by choosing to take this action and undoing this historic treaty. This request was made over a year ago. The report has still not been delivered to Congress. You would think this would be something that wouldn't be very hard for the administration to accomplish. This amendment, very simply, gives the administration some additional time to deliver the report and delays leaving the INF until it is delivered to Congress. Now, the key opponent, the most vocal opponent to Congresswoman Gabbard's amendment, simply to require an explanation from the Trump White House about why it wanted to withdraw from the IBM Treaty, was, you'll never guess, Congresswoman Liz Cheney. And she very calmly and very confidently, as though she were a member of some overwhelming majority in the House of Representatives, as opposed to the Republican Minority Party, invoked both terrorism in the best tradition of her father or the worst tradition of her father, and also Russia as a reason why the United States cannot safely stay in this treaty. Here's what Congresswoman Cheney said in voicing 
what somehow is the mainstream consensus on this committee dominated not by our party, but by Democrats. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, I uh, oppose this amendment, and uh, I, I urge my colleagues to do the same. Uh, the administration withdrew from the INF Treaty uh, rightly, uh, in my view. It had become a treaty that uh, only the United States of every country in the world uh, was abiding by. Uh, it was a treaty that was uh, handcuffing us. Uh, we know that the Russians were violating the treaty. There was absolutely no question about it. It wasn't just us, but, but our NATO allies were in lockstep with us uh, in determining that the treaty had been violated uh, and that maintaining our position of being part of the treaty was putting our security at risk. There was very little debate on this amendment. The vote was clear. The vote, the roll call vote took place and overwhelmingly Congresswoman Gabbard's amendment was defeated. Liz, Cheney arg Liz Cheney's arguments prevailed and there are no impediments now in the way of the Trump administration withdrawing from the IBM treaty, at least if the House Armed Services Committee gets its way, which it's almost certain to as a result of the bipartisan consensus. Exactly the same dynamic occurred in the attempt to impose some limitations on the Trump administration's ability to do what the Obama administration did, which is work with Saudi Arabia, transfer arms to Saudi Arabia, give intelligence to Saudi Arabia in its ongoing humanitarian atrocity of destroying Yemen, causing mass starvation and countless deaths in the poorest country on the planet. The irony of this bipartisan vote against imposing some limits in Yemen is that the argument was we can't tie the hands of the administration. The president has the right to conduct foreign policy. If he believes it's in the U.S. interest, if the Pentagon believes it's in U.S. interest to continue to fight in Yemen or to continue to support the Saudi fight in Yemen, it's not up to us, the Congress, to replace their judgment with our own. And yet, when it came time to vote on the Crow-Cheney Amendment with respect to Afghanistan, that's exactly what the House Armed Services Committee did. The Pentagon and the White House said it wanted to withdraw troops from Afghanistan. The Pentagon and the White House said it wanted to withdraw troops from Germany. And yet the House Armed Services Committee said, our judgment is going to trump yours, no pun intended. We're going to prevent you from pursuing the foreign and military policy that you want to pursue. And yet when it came time to ensure that the war continued in Yemen and U.S. support for Saudi Arabia continued, they took the exact opposite position and said it's not up to the Congress to impose limits on what the executive branch does. Whatever is the pro-war outcome, whatever is the outcome for maximalist military spending on behalf of the defense and weapons sectors that fund these members of Congress of both parties, whatever is the outcome that ensures ongoing U.S. imperialism, that's the argument that they'll use, even if that argument is the exact opposite of the one that they used just a few minutes earlier, literally, to vote on a different bill. Four, bit, four amendments, one clear anti-war side, one clear pro-war side. In each case, the pro-war side prevailed. In each case, that happened because the Democratic majority joined with the pro-war faction of the Republican Party led by Liz Cheney. There was very little opposition. It came only from small sectors of the Democratic Party on the anti-war left, in small sectors of the isolationist right. And this mainstream view about what the U.S. role should be in the world, one that is incredibly expensive to maintain at a time when Americans are suffering economically more than ever, one that has proven to be an extreme disaster for everybody but a small sector of the American uh, polity, namely its weapons manufacturers and its Pentagon officials, and one that polls overwhelmingly show most Americans oppose is the position that continues to prevail no matter which party controls Congress, no matter which party controls these committees. And the reason is that it's barely discussed what these two parties join together in order to sanction, in order to endorse, because it happens in the bowels of Congress. You have to watch 14 hours of video of proceedings as I did in order to really understand the detailed dynamics of what takes place. And then you have to do research to understand who these members are and what is motivating them, what their ideology is and who funds them and how they're working together and why. 
in order to get the full picture, something that obviously most Americans don't have time to do and don't have the ability to do because they're trying to support their families. And instead, they get their news from media outlets, major newspapers and magazines and cable news shows that barely ever discuss any of this. When is the last time you saw any explication of what the House Armed Services Committee does and who is it on these committees that are doing it and what the gap is between the propagandistic imagery that's created about them and the reality of what it is that they're doing in con Congress. Virtually never. You have to go looking for it. It's hard work to do. It takes a huge amount of time to do, and yet it's hidden from public view. And that's the reason why doing things like tearing down certain statues or lighting up the Pentagon in the rainbow flag or having the CIA celebrate Women's Day and all of the wonderful female covert operatives who help it topple democratic governments around the world is such an important distraction from the reality of what takes place because it creates this imagery, this iconography that it's good progressive liberals who are running these institutions, that it's good progressive liberals who are in charge of Democratic Party politics in the House when the reality is the complete opposite. The reality of what they do is serve their corporate donor base, serve the military and weapons manufacturers, and ensure that the U.S. continues on an unsustainable, destructive, and morally grotesque path of endless war that is a complete impediment to doing any of the things that progressives and liberals and people on the left claim to want to support. There is no way for you to be a meaningful advocate of any of those policies of improving the lives of American citizens, improving the lives of the working class, improving social programs, unless you pay attention to one of the main things that is standing in its way, one of the main diverters of resources, which is hegemony, militarism, imperialism, and endless war, all of which at the moment is being fueled by the propaganda surrounding the grave threat imposed by Russia, to a lesser extent, the grave threat posed by China, and in general, the ongoing claims about from the war on terror about the grave threat posed by terrorism, none of which is true when set aside the actual threats to American citizens and to the impediments that are created and constructed that prevent them from having better lives. And looking at the Armed Services Committee and the way certain key Democrats work with certain key Republicans in complete harmony and unison to ensure that that continues is absolutely critical, indispensable to understanding the reality of what Washington does. And that's why I decided after first reporting on this vote about Afghanistan and Germany to do a much deeper dive myself so that I could then do a deeper dive with you and hopefully shed some light on these crucial dynamics that are so often, almost always hidden on purpose from public view. I hope this was enlightening for you. Thanks so much.